Okay, so today we'll be talking about chapter 6, section 4, and the title of this is The War of 1812. And so today we'll be talking about how war broke out again between the United States and Great Britain, uh, and this time in 1812. Uh, this time again we get to talk about the White House being burned down. Oh wait, it's the White House this time, it's not the Capitol in Philadelphia, but the same principle, they burned down our Capitol again, so here we go again, and the British are going to kick our butts again. But it's not all bad, though technically this war was a stalemate, and we didn't decisively win. Uh, some people call this our second war for independence, because the British did essentially leave us alone after this, because they had bigger problems, but we'll get into that. Now, first off, why were we even talking about war with Britain? Um, because of France's war with everyone, particularly with Britain, there was a British blockade around the coast of France attempting to seal French ports to prevent British ships from entering. The goal here was to starve out the French and drive them into a peace agreement with Great Britain. And so meanwhile, um, Britain, as well as France, were in the process of seizing American ships. Since Washington had declared neutrality, we were attempting business as usual, which means we conducted quite a bit of international trade with both Britain and France. However, since these nations were at war, they would steal American cargo headed for France, or French ships would steal American cargo headed for Britain. This was a way that they could cut the supply lines to either enemy state. However, the problem is we're stuck in the middle because we are the country representing the cargo. It's our cargo they're stealing. It's our sailors they're kidnapping. And that's an act of war, folks. Because perhaps even worse than stealing cargo belonging to a sovereign nation is stealing people belonging to a sovereign nation. That's what we call impressment. You may also have heard the word Shanghai. It's another term used for impressing American citizens into British service or into French service. British ships were boarding American vessels without permission, pointing guns at our men, and forcing them to work for the British. You can call that kidnapping, you can call it shanghaiing, the formal term is impressment. Um, the president's response was to order Congress to declare an embargo, a ban on exports. The embargo meant that we would not sell any goods to Britain because they were stealing our stuff. They were kidnapping our people. And so we, we just said, we're done. We're not selling you anything. The hope was that this embargo would hurt Britain's economy. However, in fact, it actually hurt the United States economy because we were a lot newer and we relied on that international trade uh, exclusively with Britain a lot more than Britain needed us. Uh, so Congress wound up lifting it to a degree. We were going to ban all exports with all countries, remain neutral, and become entirely economically independent. However, that worked out badly for us, so we did remove the ban on exports with the exception of Britain and France because we were at war with Germany. Trade was important to America in the early 1800s. Many Americans sold crops and raw materials to foreign countries. But with France and Britain fighting a war against each other, America was caught in the middle. While America tried to remain neutral, both Britain and France began capturing American ships to block trade with their enemy. Making matters worse, Britain, in need of sailors, began capturing American sailors and forcing them to serve in the British Navy. Jefferson responded with an embargo. The United States refused to trade with any foreign country. But the embargo hurt American farmers and merchants more than it hurt either Britain or France, so it was finally lifted. Meanwhile, American settlers continued moving westward, 
but this caused problems for the Native Americans living on those lands. In 1805, Native American groups in the Old Northwest joined together to stop the settlers and prevent the destruction of their homelands and way of life. Britain also wanted to stop America's westward expansion, so it supplied the Native Americans with guns. Tensions between the United States and Britain were high when James Madison became president in 1809. Americans were angry over Britain's support of Native American fighters in the West and the continued impressment of American sailors. Congress declared war on Britain in 1812. When the War of 1812 began, Britain was still fighting the French, but the military cutbacks Thomas Jefferson had made limited America's ability to wage war. By 1814, Britain had defeated Napoleon and turned its full attention to the United States. In August, British troops marched into Washington, D.C. and set fire to many government buildings. Both sides eventually decided it was time to end the costly war. They began peace talks and signed a treaty in December of 1814. Some people called the War of 1812 the Second War of Independence. They felt that by standing up to Britain, the United States had finally secured its independence from Britain and Americans' confidence in their country soared. Okay, so the first act of war we talked about was the impressment of American sailors and the theft of American cargo by the British. And the second, while Americans were busy moving westward and winning wars against the Native Americans to take their land, one of our famous generals, William Henry Harrison, who had actually later become President of the United States for a brief time until he died, was William Henry Harrison. And he had made several land deals with Native American chiefs. And yet, the chief of the Shawnee tribe, named Tecumseh, attempted to form a confederacy or an alliance between neighboring Native American tribes. And Tecumseh's confederacy hoped to rid their lands of American invaders. They urged their people to return to traditional beliefs and practices and give up any religion or culture they had learned from the American people. Um, they attempted to negotiate with Harrison at first to pressure him to leave their lands and their people alone. In fact, they began to negotiate with the British and asked the British for help in what will probably become a war between Tecumseh's Confederacy and the American people. Now many tribes didn't join this Confederacy. In fact, many were content attempting to assimilate and live beside uh, the United States. However, Tecumseh and his allies insisted on Native American independence. And so they went to war. Uh, with William Henry Harrison and his military detachment. Um, Harrison actually ran for president on his laurels from this war with the Native American Confederacy. At the Battle of Tippecanoe, Harrison was a war hero. Uh, though he suffered heavy losses, he defeated Tecumseh's army. And when they were going over the remains, and searching through the battle and they confiscated weapons weapons that were made by the British that were being used by American enemies against us the British had armed our enemies to help them fight us the second act of war And so meanwhile, the Warhawks were members of Congress that favored war with Great Britain because of these two reasons. And so for that reason, we use the term hawk when referring to someone who favors war. And by contrast, we use the term dove 
when someone prefers peace. A dove is the international symbol of peace. And hawk now is associated with a desire for conflict. So meanwhile, James Madison, President of the United States at this time, chooses war. It is his responsibility, after all, to send soldiers and to give that order. And he did so because he believed that Britain was crippling U.S. trade. And yet, while we had perhaps sound reason for going to war with Britain, we were very unprepared. The army was unprepared. It was very small. We had a very minimal standing army, as we learned about yesterday with Thomas Jefferson. And Britain had the most powerful navy on the planet. And so early in the war, the British were kicking our butts. They won in Detroit. They won in Canada. And generally were winning the first part of the battle. We did score some significant victories, such as um, on Lake Erie. Uh, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry uh, defeated the British there and won several battles and had a successful Canadian campaign. And um, Native Americans were caught up on both sides of the conflict. Tecumseh and his Confederacy fought for the British, and he was later killed in battle. Now at sea, we were woefully unprepared. We had only 16 ships in our entire Navy. 16 in the entire Navy, representing a country of over 4 million people. 16 ships. Now, I don't know exactly how many Britain had, but I would say it's close to 100 or more versus 16. I mean, if ever there was a hopeless cause, that's it. Now, only three of these ships were of the class that we would consider worthy of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British. Frigate class. We had three capable of actually holding a broadside battle with a general British ship. Three for our entire country. <laughs> so it's pretty sad, obviously. Um, and so the British effectively blockaded all U.S. ports along the East Coast. So they were able to cut us off rather easily. Now, this successful Canadian campaign, oh yes, we invaded Canada. That has actually happened. In 1812, we made a full-scale invasion of Canada and we burned their capital city to the ground. It was still British soil and it was during the war with Britain, so it was considered a successful raid on a British territory. And in retaliation, in 1814, in the very last year of the war, the British Army raided and burned towns along the Atlantic coast. In particular, they burned Washington, D.C. to the ground. And James Madison had to hop on Air Force One carriage and get out of there, right? He had to flee the American capital. Can you imagine? The American president has now fleed the American capital. Where are those rednecks with shotguns when we need them? Um, and so this was in retaliation uh, for the burning of York and towns in Canada. Now, here's an interesting footnote in history for you. Shortly after the burning of the White House, we negotiated a settlement and agreed to an armistice, otherwise a stalemate, with Great Britain. But before word could be reached to Andrew Jackson, who was uh, an American military general fighting in the southern part of the United States, before word could spread to him, he attacked and defeated a larger British force in the city of New Orleans. And so after the war was over, we won a glorious victory. And so generally this war was characterized by the fact that we had a tiny navy that wasn't capable of actually fighting against the British, and uh, generally it ended with our capital being burned to the ground, and the fact that we were lucky that Britain had bigger problems because Napoleon was still picking a fight in Europe. Um, however, <laughs> we get to say the last battle went to us, and it was a glorious one. Jackson led an army against a British force that was nearly twice his size and won a resounding victory in New Orleans.
the allegiance of these first New Americans, the New Orleanians, would quickly be tested in the War of 1812 under the leadership of General Andrew Jackson. The eyes of country and world now focused upon their response to an imminent British attack upon New Orleans. It is no mere coincidence that as the United States is getting ready to go to war with Great Britain, that's a good time to bring Louisiana into the Union and make sure that the residents of Louisiana are full participants in the nation. And we can see this in the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. People were wondering, people like Andrew Jackson were wondering, how is the local population going to react to this battle? Are they going to actually side with the British uh, against the United States, or will they actually help defend the colony? And the truth is, they helped defend the colony. And in fact, uh, the crucial people at the Battle of New Orleans were the Creole artillerymen. And so this showed that now the, the colonists in Louisiana considered themselves Americans. The Americans from Louisiana had helped rout Great Britain in the Battle of New Orleans. It was a signal to the world of America's growing power. Farther upriver, enterprising Americans were pouring into the fertile regions of the upper Mississippi Valley. Like Lewis and Clark, these brave pioneers were a symbol of American perseverance. But fueled by their own hasty penetration into the frontier, settlers found themselves facing hostile Indian attacks. People were greatly concerned about this becoming a routine thing uh, with the Indians, attacking these outposts. Much of the North American West remained a territory that was under the control of Indians. As far as they understood things, White settlers from the U.S. were the most land-hungry, most violent, most difficult people in North America. The Louisiana Purchase gives Jefferson this, uh, this opportunity to, to think differently about how to handle the relationships between Indians and whites, if you will. And unfortunately, the idea that he comes up with leads ultimately to removal and to all the destruction that happens to the Indian tribes and, and, and culture in the 19th century. Jefferson's idea was to push Indians west of the Mississippi River clearing the eastern banks for farming and trapping settlements. But as the United States began to expand westward, more and more Native Americans were displaced. The lands of the present-day state of Iowa were named after the Iowa Indians, who were pushed westward to accommodate an American land rush. And the Sioux Indians in Minnesota were moved to reservations in Nebraska. These stories would play out again and again in this new American land. The instruments which we have just signed will cause no tears to be shed. They prepare ages of happiness for innumerable generations of human creatures. Robert Livingston. But many tears and blood drops would be shed following the purchase. First for Native Americans and now for another group of oppressed people who desired freedom, slaves in America. And so peace was made at the Treaty of Ghent an agreement signed on Christmas Day of 1814. And this declared an armistice or an end to the fighting. An armistice simply means that both sides agree to a mutual stalemate based on certain conditions. It does not resolve all of the issues that we had with Great Britain. We cannot call this a resounding American victory, but we certainly don't have to call it a defeat. And the agreement made between the two nations that would resolve the conflict was that commercial treaties could reopen trade between Great Britain and the United States. Even though we were at war with France, even though they were at war with France still, we can resume business. A separate treaty called the Rush Bago Agreement limited British warships on the Great Lakes. They still maintained a small standing army on the Great Lakes because that was the U.S. border with Canada and after all we had invaded Canada during this war and Canada was still a British territory. And then also it was agreed upon that we would have a northern boundary of the Louisiana Territory. It was set at the 49th parallel and so that is now the northern boundary of the United States. Britain and the United States also agreed to jointly occupy the Oregon territories. And later, in the mid-1800s, President James K. Polk will run successfully for president on the promise to go to war with Great Britain if they don't give us the Oregon territory. Different country, right? Different time. Literally, James K. Polk's campaign slogan 
was 56, 46, 40, or fight. Give us Oregon and Washington, or we will go to war with Great Britain. And that's how he got elected president. Can you imagine? What if one of our candidates today were to promise to go to war with a country unless they gave up some of their territory? Everybody would laugh. We'd go, that's ridiculous. Maybe. I hope. Well, I would assume that people would go, that's ridiculous. But nonetheless, in 1846, a candidate won the presidency on the promise to go to war if another country didn't give us their territory. So different times, I suppose. All right, so your fun little practice quiz for the day. In 1812, how did Madison respond? to Britain's harmful actions against American trade. Anybody? Yes, C. Eventually he decided to go to war. Uh, Jefferson declared the trade embargo. Um, we are the ones who invaded Canada and Britain was the one committing impressment against us, so war would have been the only option.